Well, it is a great pleasure to be with you all this morning, and I uh, want to thank John, the president, the provost, the faculty, for the kind invitation to come and speak to you. It is slightly odd speaking at a student recruitment day for another institution. I'm not sure if that's a conflict of interest or not. Uh, also, to thank those who work behind the scenes to get me here. Often, there are always people who book the hotels and uh, make sure everything runs on time that are often forgotten in the thanks. So I want to thank all of the support staff who've been involved in getting me here this day. I want to speak today about identity politics, as John has just uh, uh, hinted. I've spent the last 12 months uh, speaking on this an awful lot, and one of the, the interesting things is whenever I'm booked to speak on this topic, uh, the news of that week almost always throws up a new example of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm never at a loss for a new beginning to the lectures I give. And of course, uh, this week uh, we have the Senate confirmation hearings for uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson where she was famously asked uh, to define woman and uh, demurred. She, she sort of refused to answer that question. Just a week before, back in my homeland, you may tell from my accent, I, I'm not from Camden, New Jersey. Uh, just a week before, the Labour Party shadow minister for women in the United Kingdom, a woman called Annalise Dodds, was asked to define woman. Uh, of course, that is the uh, ministry that she's shadowing, so one would have thought that being able to define the term uh, that lies at the very heart of one's job description would be a fairly basic qualification for the job. She spent three and a half minutes explaining how she could not define the term. How has this come about? Why is it now not simply plausible to express agnosticism over a question that 40, 50 years ago would have been regarded as so simple and straightforward there was no point in even asking it. Why has it become not simply plausible to express agnosticism over this, but why is it increasingly a matter of political and cultural imperative to express agnosticism over it? Well, I can't give you a comprehensive answer to that this morning. But I want to sow a few seeds in your mind that will hopefully give you some tools by which to think about it. It did not happen overnight, one might say. When something as dramatic as the problematization, the turning into a problem of a question such as what is woman, when something like that so dramatic appears to happen so quickly in our culture in the space of just a few years, it is very clear, or it should be very clear, that the foundations for that, the basic cultural logic behind that has been established over many generations. We might say the soil in which that idea can grow and flourish has been laid down for generations. And I want to talk today, I want to just offer a few observations on the things that I think feed into the plausibility of that statement. Basically, first and foremost, I think the plausibility of the confusion over a category such as woman is a function of the more general kind of selves we imagine ourselves to be. I'm very grateful to Dr. Horner for speaking on this topic on Wednesday. Uh, he would have used the term self a lot just to uh, remind you or to clarify for those who weren't here, the way I'm using the term self. There are numerous ways we use the term self in the way we talk. There is the simple common sense way we talk about the self as in, I'm aware I'm me and not you. We use the term self to refer to what we might say a, a sphere of self-consciousness. I'm aware I'm me, I'm aware I'm not Dr. Horner. I presume uh, the same applies to him. He's aware he's Dr. Horner, he's not me. That is not the way I want to use the term self in this lecture. When I use the term self, I'm thinking about what is it that makes us tick? What is it that grounds our identity? What is it that makes me me? And I want to suggest that what makes me me today and what makes you you is characterized by something that philosophers and sociologists call expressive individualism, 
You may not have heard of the term, but I want to now just elaborate a little bit on what the term means. Expressive individualism is this idea that we are primarily that which we are inside. Inside here, we are made up of our feelings. That inner psychological space is what makes us us. It what makes you you and what makes me me. Well, you might say what's unusual, what's radical about that? Uh, haven't human beings always had that inner space? Go back and you can read the Psalms, and the Psalms are full of the psalmist reflecting on that inner space. The psalmist feels despair. The psalmist feels elation. The psalmist feels confusion. The psalmist clearly has an inner space. I want to suggest, though, that today we grant more authority to that inner space than in times past. Think about it, just take as a, as a sort of thought experiment. If you'd gone to your doctor 100 or 150 years ago and said to your doctor, I, I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, the response of the doctor would have been, well, that's a problem. And it's a problem of the mind. And we need to treat the mind to bring it into line with the body. If you were to go to the doctor with that same issue today, the doctor would again respond, it's a problem, but the answer as he fleshed it out, would be different. He'd say, that's a problem of the body. We need to bring it into line with the mind. Notice the difference between those two scenarios. What has gone on in the intervening time between those two little thought experiments? Well, what's gone on is this. The authority granted to inner psychological feelings and convictions has been dramatically increased, made far more powerful, than it once was, to the point where it becomes definitive of one's identity. So the first thing about expressive individualism is that it authorizes or grants an authority to that inner space. It's kind of unprecedented in history. Secondly, what it tends to do is it tends to identify happiness with a psychological sense of well-being. What makes you happy is what makes you feel good in an immediate sense. Again, we could, uh, I'll use myself as a sort of victim of this analogy. Uh, we could look, uh, compare myself to my grandfather. If my grandfather was here and I would say to my granddad, granddad, do you get uh, job satisfaction? My grandfather's been dead 30 years, so it, it is a very much a thought experiment. If I said to my grandfather, uh, do you get job satisfaction? Well, my grandfather was somebody who left school at 14, and work for over 50 years in a factory as a sheet metal worker, doing what I would regard as very boring and repetitive work. First of all, my grandfather would probably not have understood the question. And secondly, once I'd explained it to my grandfather, I think he'd have responded in this way. He'd have said, if you're asking if I consider my work worthwhile, yes. I get paid a fair day's wage for an honest day's work. And I'm able to meet my obligations to my wife and my children. I can put shoes on their feet and food on the table. Notice my grandfather, we might say, his sense of self, his sense of satisfaction comes from him meeting his obligations, meeting his obligations to those who are dependent upon him. If you ask me that same question, first of all, I would understand what you mean. You would not have to explain it. And secondly, I'm likely to say something like this. Yes, I get a real buzz out of standing in front of a class of young people, teaching an idea, a complicated idea, and seeing light bulbs go on in their minds as they come to grasp a complicated idea. I get an immediate satisfaction from that. Notice the difference. My sense of satisfaction is nothing to do with me meeting obligations towards other people. It's the immediate buzz I get from doing what I'm doing. The expressive individual, the one who places such great premium on that inner space, is the one who tends to think of happiness as an immediate psychological experience. That has an interesting effect on the way we tend to view the world. The way it works out in general is this. Our relationship as individuals towards the world, towards other people in the world, towards other things in the world, institutions, things we buy, etc., etc., is to see them as good 
to the extent that they make us feel good. And to see them as problematic or bad to the extent they don't make us feel good. We might say it tilts us towards, we might say, an adversarial approach to the world where the world is, first of all, a threat to our happiness, and only when it's shown to help us feel happy does it become something we embrace. And that we might connect to another point. There's a strong tendency then in this way of thinking that removes from the world any intrinsic moral shape and sees the morality of the world as, well, does this thing make me happy or does it make me sad? Does it enable me to realize myself or does it get in the way? A strong tendency, in other words, if you like, to see the world as stuff. Now, perhaps uh, what I've said so far is, is not entirely clear to some of you, but let's Think of a couple of examples that might make this, make this more real. Think of the logic of abortion. Modern abortion laws, modern pro-abortion attitudes tend to assume that the embryo in the womb is just stuff. And the morality of abortion is therefore determined by whether bringing the baby to term or terminating it adds or subtracts from the happiness of the mother carrying the child. You read Peter Singer, uh, the great pro-abortion uh, philosopher. That's essentially his argument. A baby should be carried to term if it's going to make the parents happier, and it should be terminated if it's going to make them sadder. Think about that. The baby in the womb is just stuff. The position is kind of an adversarial one, the morality of the act is determined by the psychological results of the act. No-fault divorce. Think about no-fault divorce. What does no-fault divorce do? Well, it assumes that marriage is a breakable bond to be dissolved once it ceases to meet the emotional needs of the parties involved. Two people are married. Uh, once they stop feeling happy about that arrangement, they can depart from that arrangement for any reason or no reason at all. Marriage becomes, if you like, a contract to make two people happy. The logic, you'll notice, uh, doesn't take account of any children. Children are to be dealt with as collateral damage after the divorce is finalized. Obligation to others doesn't come into it. Obligation to self lies at the heart of it. The self underlying this is autonomous, selfish in every sense of the word, unencumbered by commitments, and suspicious of external authorities. Obligation to anyone or anything other than the individual is purely voluntary. What makes me happy? What prevents me being sad? We could look at the history of this. There's a long and elaborate history, and I know Dr. Horner got into this somewhat on Wednesday. Uh, the crisis of the Reformation and the, the slow breaking down of the authority of external institutions. The rise of technology, and that's what I want to zero in on in just a few moments' time. Those of you interested in the history of philosophy will know that philosophy really from the mid-16th century onwards takes what's called an inward turn, becomes more interested in what's going on in here, we might say, than what's going on out there. And political thought, particularly in democracies, and democracy is a good thing, by the way, but political thought in democracies tend to be built upon individual rights. What do I have a right to rather than who or what am I obliged to? I want to zero in, however, particularly on the last two. Well, sorry, the, the rise of technology and political thought. But first of all, think about consumerism. Uh, how does this stuff come to shape our minds? I could list philosophers for you. Rousseau, Nietzsche, Marx, etc. Freud. But very few people read those today. How is it that this notion of the self, this belief that I am sovereign and my happiness is the most important thing out there, 
How has it come to be part of the way we intuit the world, we imagine the world to be? Well, think about consumerism. Every time you switch on the television and you see a commercial, what do you see? You're having a future-oriented myth preached at you based upon your personal satisfaction. The idea that the very next thing will bring you that sense of happiness and well-being. By and large, commercials are not built on utility, on whether things are useful. They're built on whether it fulfills the desire you have. Again, use myself as a negative example. Midlife crises, thoroughly recommend them. Uh, you're a long way, most of you, from a midlife crisis. Uh, a few years ago, for the first time ever in my life, I bought my wife a, a new car. Moved to Western Pennsylvania. You need a, 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 an all-wheel drive in Western Pennsylvania in the winter. We have this thing called snow. I know that you don't get it here in California. Uh, I'm going back to a snowstorm on Sunday. I'm just hoping I can get back from the airport. Anyway, I bought my wife this new car, all-wheel drive, and she was so favorable towards me for the sort of 48 hours after that that I thought, now is the time to strike. Uh, and I said, is it okay if I buy a soft top sports car, two-seater sports car. And in a moment of weakness, she said yes. We were actually driving on the freeway at the time, and I pulled over at the next rest stop, called my son, who worked at that point in the car industry, and said, fix it now. Your mum will have changed her mind in four hours' time. I need it fixed now. So I am now the proud owner of a soft top sports car. I'd like to own two, a red one. I own a red one. I'd love to own a red one and a blue one. Uh, I only have two moods. I'm either angry or sad. Uh, and if I'm angry, I'll drive the red one. If I'm sad, I drive the blue one. <laughs> Bottom line is, this car, though, is, in terms of its utility, no different from any other car I've ever owned. Gets me from A to B. Why did I want a sports car? I desired the image. I desired the experience. I wanted to feel cool, or as cool as a bald man in his mid-50s can feel, <laughs> uh, when I was driving around the lanes of Western Pennsylvania. It was sold to me by desire. It was not about utility, it was about desire. That, of course, is exactly what consumerism preaches to us. Think of politics. In a democratic society, politicians essentially have to sell themselves. How do they sell themselves? They sell themselves by telling you, essentially, they will make you happy. Politicians get elected by selling you a message that says, you will be happier under me than under the other person. Psychologized world as well also places a great premium on aesthetics. When you think about what makes us happy, it's often the surface appearance of things. Beauty, taste, what makes us feel good or stimulates desire. What's interesting, just as an aside, is how this has come to supplant ethics. I didn't realize until I switched on the news this morning, we're just two days away from the Oscars. I never watch the Oscars, but being as I'm English, and, and for something to be funny for an Englishman, somebody has to be in pain somewhere. We're a kind of race of psychopaths from that front, on that front. Uh, I always watch the, the, the day after, when they focus in on the fashion disasters. You know, there's nothing an Englishman likes more than watching somebody else being mocked on the television. <laughs> the red carpet is interesting though, isn't it? The red carpet is the parade of the great, the good, and the powerful, the beautiful. When you watch the Oscar red carpet, my bet is that most of us feel some twinge of desire to be like those people, to be the center of attention, to be as beautiful or as good looking as the people parading before us. Ask yourself, how many abortions are represented on the Oscar red carpet? How many broken marriages? How many children screwed up by the sexual incontinence of their parents? Are represented there. But none of that counts because we're mesmerized by the beauty we see. In the modern world where the key thing is that which makes me feel good, the aesthetic surface, the beauty, the style comes to supplant talk of right and wrong. 
Again, just as another aside, a few years ago, shows you how deep the, the cult of beauty goes in America. By the way, I've always been, American weather girls, what is it about if you don't quite tall enough to be a supermodel, you become a meteorologist? <laughs> Have you asked that question? But it's a serious question, though. You laugh, but it's a serious question. It's a serious question. Why do people on television all have to be relentlessly good-looking? Why? There's a cult of beauty in America. It's very, very interesting. Some years ago, I was living in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia was voted the ugliest city in the United States. The people in Philadelphia were voted, on average, uglier than anybody else. Uh, <laughs> I remember at the time uh, I was teaching and the students were really upset and I made the point. No, it makes, them, it makes Philadelphia the best place in the country to live because you can be a perfectly ordinary looking guy, but in Philadelphia, you look like Brad Pitt. <laughs> so, think about technology. How does technology shape how we think about these things? One of the biggest mistakes we make when we think about technology is this. It allows us to do the same things only faster and more efficiently. That is not what technology does. Technology fundamentally changes your relationship to the world. Think about growing up in the Middle Ages. You're stuck in a place. You'll more than likely be born, live, and die in the same town. You will be baptized, married, and buried in the same church. You will not travel more than 10 or 15 miles from where you were born. Your life will be completely dependent upon the seasons. Who you are is fixed externally. Technology changes all that. At this point in time, I'm six, 7,000 miles away from where I grew up. When I emigrated in 2001, my experience of emigration was not the experience of somebody in the 17th century. When I would have said goodbye to my family on the dockside at Bristol, knowing that I would never see them again, never hear their voice again. I call my mother, every Sunday or every other Sunday to speak to her and check in and see how she's doing. COVID has made it a bit weird, but I intend to get back and see my mom this summer. Emigration for me is an entirely different experience to what it was three or 400 years ago. My mom's also discovered texting. She's very disturbing. Uh, <laughs> you will know, as you grow up, you will discover that in the eyes of your mother, you're always 14 years old. Uh, and it's terrible now my mom has instant access to me anywhere. Music. I'm guessing most, if not all of us in this room, enjoy music. How do you enjoy music? You enjoy it as a private experience most of the time. You listen, you listen on Spotify. You listen on headphones. You listen on your phone. 200 years ago, if you wanted to experience music, it had to be live and you had to be there. We do not experience music more efficiently than they did 200 years ago. We have a completely different experience of music today, privatized and consumerized. To get more pointed, think about transgenderism. The transgender moment is only plausible in a technological society. That doctor 150 years ago had no choice but to say it's a problem of the mind, not of the body, because there was nothing he could do with the body. He couldn't even imagine doing anything with the body. Technology now allows us to imagine this can be a physical problem, and we can deal with it via surgery and hormone treatment. Technology doesn't just give us the same world faster and more efficiently. Technology gives us a different world. It enables the idea, the intuition, that the world is raw material, and that the key thing in this is our will. We are able to shape this raw material to fit our desires, not just physically, but morally too. Again, think of traditional sexual morality. Sex only in marriage, marriage for life. That's pretty much the only plausible option in a world before antibiotics, contraception, and abortion. If you're a young guy and you want to sleep with a girl, what do you got to do in the 19th century? 
Well, you could be highly risky, you could engage in highly risky behavior that could lead to terrible diseases or unwanted pregnancies. Or, more likely, you're going to have to be clean, you're going to have to have a job, you're going to have to persuade the girl that she's a good bet for life, that you're going to stick by, you have to persuade her parents that you're a good bet for life. You have to persuade her siblings you're a good bet for life. You have to make an effort. We might say sex is expensive in the 19th century. It places demands upon us. Now, contraception, antibiotics, make it a cheap and easy pastime. And the morality becomes imaginable in a different way. Christian sexual morality is kind of the only show in town in the 19th century in the West. Practically speaking, now it no longer has that external shape of the world to reinforce it. It was interesting, when I was writing my, my book, I did quite a lot of research on the AIDS crisis, particularly in California uh, in the 1980s. What was interesting was the the gay community was divided over to how to handle the AIDS crisis. There were strong voices early on in the gay community that called for a reformation of behavior among the male homosexual community. Essentially, a kind of moral solution. Not a moral solution I would approve of uh, myself as a Christian, but a moral solution that said we need to clean up our act. We need to change our behavior. Those voices were very quickly eliminated. Very quickly eliminated in favor of a technological solution. We just need better drugs to handle the consequences of our action. Think of the imagination that lies behind that. The world is just stuff, and when the world bites back, we merely need to find a technological solution to overcome it. If the world bites back and says, no, you cannot be happy in pursuing this particular angle of behavior, we need to find a technology that allows us to overcome that. Technology feeds our belief in the moral world's moral shapelessness and correlatively in our power and sovereignty. And notice, it reinforces the replacement of right and wrong as categories with aesthetics and feelings. If we can do it, if it makes us feel good, we should do it. That's the position we find ourselves in today. It's interesting, the German philosopher Martin Heidegger makes a very prescient comment about technology. He says, this is a paraphrase, not a direct quotation. Most quotations from Heidegger are utterly incomprehensible. So I've, I've put it into plain English. Uh, the most dangerous thing about technology, Heidegger thought, was this, is not that it will produce weapons of mass destruction. It's that it will totally dehumanize us in a way that is totally destructive of who we actually are. Technology allows us to think that we are God and are in control. We might also add in this story of the self, how is it that this inner self has become so powerful? We might say that traditional external sources of authority have become incredibly weak. Can't go into the details in this lecture, but think of what are the traditional sources of identity over the last 100, 150 years, family. I grew up in a family where mum and dad stayed together. I never doubted who I was. Whatever happened at school, whatever happened outside the home, I still went home at night and mum and dad were there. And I knew who I was. When you dissolve what a family is, you dissolve a context for knowing who you are. The nation. I'm fascinated by the existence of the 1619 Project. I have no dog in the fight, I'm not an American. Uh, I joked to the students, I said, well, was America founded with the arrival of slaves or an illegal colonial rebellion? It really doesn't matter to me as a British person, one way or the other. What is fascinating about the 1619 Project is this, that it exists at all. When a nation starts questioning its origins, a nation is questioning its identity at a very, very fundamental level. It doesn't matter which side in that debate you come down on, the existence of that debate tells me 
The nation no longer has that strong external authority it once had. I was fascinated when I came to America in 2001 by a phrase that was often used in the news media that I don't hear so much today. It fascinated me because Britain, England has no equivalent. The phrase was un-American, that's un-American. Certain behaviors, certain ideas were considered un-American. That word can only exist where there is a deep consensus on what American means. I don't hear that word anymore. Again, that would seem to me to be a kind of tell that the nation no longer knows who she is. It's no longer a strong source of identity. And church, think about the church. The church has been weak as a source of identity and increasingly weak for many generations now. All three of those, notice, are attenuated, are weakened by the role of technology. Geography, physical presence are no longer the important things they used to be. I was fascinated in the summer of 2020 when the Black Lives Matter protests were going on that analogous protests took place in Britain at the same time as there were pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a British colony until 1997. As an adult, I watched on television the handing back of Hong Kong to the Chinese government. In my adult lifetime, there were no protests that I could see and report in the media in Britain about the crackdown on democracy in a recent British colony. It was odd to me that many British people seemed to feel more of a sense of identity with people in Minneapolis than they did with people in Hong Kong. Again, I'm not putting that forward as a critical comment. It's an observation. How and why? The internet. The internet made Minneapolis very present and Hong Kong very distant. The nation has been attenuated by technology. The interesting thing about this is the basic dynamics of what I've described are present in seed form in the biblical narrative of the fall. The book I wrote that was mentioned earlier, it's over 400 pages long. That's why I did the short version, like the Cliff Notes version. Uh, I had nu numerous people, I got one this morning, people e keep emailing me and saying, why don't you begin with this, or why don't you begin with that? Somebody emailed me and said, why don't you begin with Eve in the garden? To which the answer is, the book's 400 pages long already. If you want a 100,000 page book, I could have done it, but even less people would have read that than read the big one. But on one level, it's not a bad question. Because when you look at the story of the fall, we see the dynamics of modern selfhood in seed form in the actions of Eve. I'll read you the passage. It's very familiar, of course. Uh, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes, is Genesis 3, 6, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Notice, we could make a number of observations about uh, that verse. Notice there's a focus on aesthetics. Eve sees that the tree was good for food. She sees that the fruit was a delight to the eyes. It's the dynamic I was describing with the Oscar red carpet earlier on, a focus on aesthetics. And one would have to say that in the narrative of the fall, she's presumably correct on that point. Presumably, the tree was good for food in the sense of it would provide her with nourishing calories. And it was pleasing to the eye. Secondly, notice, technical ability drives moral possibility. She can reach out and touch it. She can reach out and take it. So she does reach out and take it. It's not technology, so to speak, but it's the kind of logic that, will, that technology will put on steroids ought determined by can. And notice she sees the created world as being there for her personal benefit. She takes. She takes it. 
And this is an assertion of identity, I think. We could say that what Eve is doing here is playing identity politics. Her desire and her action deny the moral shape of the universe. She denies that the external shape of the universe is determinative of who she is. Secondly, her desire and her action lead her to assert her own sovereignty, autonomy, and freedom. Thirdly, she becomes the one who decides what is good and what is evil. She becomes like God. Were her desire for God, her identity, we might say, would have remained and would have remained sound. Her desire however, to be like God represents a fundamental change in who she understands herself to be. And we could go on in the Genesis narrative then to Genesis 4, of course, and say what's interesting is that straight after Genesis 3 and the fall, we have Cain's murder of his brother Abel. How might we describe that? Abel becomes an object to Cain who stands in the way of Cain's sense of happiness and must therefore be disposed of. Others are turned into objects. Genesis 3 and 4, is that not our modern imagination in miniature? Who we are is determined by how we find happiness as individuals. The fulfillment of our desires, not our conformity to some image of God, is what drives us. And that is shaped by the possibilities, often the technological possibilities, with which society presents us. Leads me then, as I'm drawing things to a conclusion in the next few minutes, I want to add a sort of postscript to this. Okay, I've described here expressive individualism, and I've argued that the seeds of it are there in the fall, and it's profoundly enabled by technology that gives us this feeling that we are in control. And it's occurred at a point in history where external forms of authority are crumbling away. Why has it become so crazily obsessed with sex and sexual identity? A number of reasons. We could give an intellectual narrative of this. We could look at the figure, say, of Oscar Wilde in the 19th century great precursor of the modern day. If Wilde saw a, a sexual rule in place, he wanted to transgress it. He wanted to be the great self-creator. In many ways, I think Oscar Wilde is the fulfillment of Nietzsche's philosophy of the powerful, transgressive individual. Commercials. Commercials constantly play, not just on desire, but specifically on sexual desire. The mainstreaming of pornography. Notice that pornography, often I think Christians rightly, we object to pornography because of its, the lust it promotes and uh, the way it connects to uh, uh, exploitation. But notice too, in some ways, it's the most brutally honest expression of modern personhood. Other people are reduced to mere instruments for the satisfaction of the person watching. Roger Scruton, the great British English, it's an important distinction by the way, if you like, Britain is a construct of the American mind. My wife is Scottish, I'm English. We are a mixed race marriage by British standards. My wife grew up swearing she would never marry an Englishman. And she did. Hey, I'm just so desirable, I guess. I was irresistible. <laughs> Roger Scruton puts it this way. Pornography turns faces into bodies. It teaches us to look upon other people as mere objects. I do this little experiment when I teach at Grove. Uh, I teach the upper level humanities course. It's a final year course. There's almost always an engaged couple in the class when I teach it. Uh, and to make this point, I'll ask, for, is there an engaged couple here? They put their hands up and I will say to, first of all, I, I like to be cruel because I'm English. Uh, I, I ask the, uh, the guy, you know, what first attracted you to your fiance? And because it's such a simple and straightforward question, they assume it's a trick question, which is fantastic, because they delay answering. And you see the color in the girl's face rising as it appears that her fiance can't remember what he found attractive about her. Never fails. 
I always say, you know, just, just say she's beautiful. That, that typically works. Uh, but then I say, imagine, okay, imagine on the wedding day. You're there, you're waiting at the front of the church, and the music changes, and, and that's the change, you know, the bridesmaids have all come in, the music changes, you know this is the moment when she has arrived. And as a Pavlovian response, you automatically turn around because you want to see what she looks like on her wedding day. And you turn around and you see this beautiful woman at the end of the aisle. But you're engaged to Alison. And it's some girl called Julia who's there. She's beautiful. You know her. She's a lovely personality. You could probably get married and have a happy marriage. Do you go through with the marriage? And the answer, well, the answer every time I've asked that question so far has been this. No. I suspect that's the right answer. Why not? Is the follow-up question. Why not? Everything you're going to do with the girl you're engaged to, you can do with this girl. She's beautiful, etc., etc. Why don't you go through with it? And the answer comes back, because I want to marry Alison. I don't want to marry anybody in general. I want to marry this person in particular. And we intuitively know that's correct. Very few of us watching the news where you see those tragic scenarios where a couple get married just hours before the one is to die of cancer. Very few of us watch those things and say, what a ridiculous thing to do. We don't think that because we know that's not what marriage is about. We know that marriage is about treating the person as an end in themselves, not a means to an end. Marriage is about marrying a face, not a body. Pornography teaches us to think of sex and other people as bodies, not faces. It dehumanizes on that level. All of these things, I think, play in to making sexual desire a powerful part of modern day politics. I think sexual desire has been perennially powerful. Unlike some other aspects of modern politics, for example, race, I think sexual desire is not merely a social construct. You look back through the great literature over the, uh, the centuries, go right back to the Iliad, what's the Iliad about? Some guy runs off with some other guy's wife and it precipitates a 10 year war. Sexual desire right, lies right at the heart of the dramatic dynamic there. Think of, it makes sense from a biblical perspective. The sexual act between a man and a woman is the supremely creative act, isn't it? I had the pleasure recently of becoming a grandfather and holding my granddaughter in my arms. It was amazing to think that I had, my wife and I had created life and the life that we had created had gone on to create life. Nothing like it. The image of God, I think, is no more powerfully expressed than in the creation of new life. Desire, sexual desire, is at the heart of human desire, not for merely social reasons, but because it is rooted in the image of God. And that's why it becomes so perverted by the fall. Not explicitly in Genesis 3, but certainly if we move to 2 Samuel chapter 11, David and Bathsheba incident, we see the fall kind of recapitulated, sort of replayed. Let me read the passage to you. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is it not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Notice, reading that passage against the background of Genesis 3, what might we say? First of all, aesthetics. He saw that the woman was beautiful and pleasing to the eyes. Ethics disappears, drowned by aesthetics at that point. Secondly, notice the depersonalization of Bathsheba. When we're talking about David and Bathsheba in this passage, she's always the woman. She's only referred to as Bathsheba when Uriah is mentioned. The next time she's referred to as Bathsheba is when she is mourning Uriah. To Uriah, she's a face. To David, she is just a body. 
She has no personal identity. She is an object, an instrument for David's use and happiness. David at this point ceases to be king. He becomes the one defined by his uncontrolled sexual desire. And David, I would suggest, is a paradigm of us all. He's a paradigm of the modern man or woman. He sees himself as sovereign. He is sovereign. In a sense, he's king. But of course, Israel's king is to be a vice-regent for the great king, for God. He sees himself as autonomous. He sees that autonomy as something to be used as he sees fit to give him immediate satisfaction and happiness. He has no great concern for any greater authority than his own fallen desire. David is the modern man. All of this is to say once the inner space of humanity was authorized, given, I think, the powerful nature of sexual desire and its connection to the fact that we are made in the image of God, it was inevitable that that desire would tilt strongly in a sexual direction and that human identity would become wrapped up with an autonomous attitude to our sexual desire. And that is easily fueled by the wider cultural factors, technology, consumerism, internet pornography that we're surrounded by now. The narratives of even David show that sexual identity, I would suggest, is the fundamental form of human rebellion because it detaches human beings from the God in whose image they are made and to which image they are made to conform in a powerful way. And I didn't mention it, but notice, David takes. Samuel, when Israel asks for a king, says, I'll give you a king, but he's going to take. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your lands. He's going to take your wives. And we think of that as Saul. First time in the David narrative, the language of take is applied to him is there. Bathsheba. Something has gone wrong. I want to end with a question. Given the nature of the modern self, I think a question first posed in this form by the Russian Orthodox theologian Sergei Bulgakov is worth leaving you with. It's worth turning it over in your mind. It comes in the foreword of his great book on the doctrine of Christ, the Lamb of God. Drawing on the very imagery of Genesis 3, he says this, a question slithers like a serpent over the earth. Whose world is it? The God-man's or the man-God's? Christ's or the Antichrist's? Well, in its developing notion of the modern self, particularly as that modern self has found expression in the sexual revolution, the world has given its answer. It is the man-God's. Men and women are God's to shape this world in whatever way fits their desire and meets their personal satisfactions. Challenge for us, and I'm in my 50s now, I'm getting on a bit, but you, many of you have all of your lives ahead of you. The challenge for your generation is this. Can you, by your teaching, by your way of life, by your worship, show other Christians first and the world second that it is the God-man's? Let us pray. Oh, Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this creation. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us for the times that we have treated it as mere stuff, when the times we have asserted ourselves as sovereign and authoritative. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would humble us, that you would lead us to repent of our sins, and you would draw us once again to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we are saved. We pray, O Lord, that you would make us salt and light to this generation within this darkened world. We pray, O Lord, that you would protect us, body and soul, and that you would keep us safe until that great day when we shall gather before your throne and we will not just know, but we will see that this world belongs to the God-man. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.